morning, everybody, and welcome to the second of the South UK and Ireland series of webinars. Today, we shall be covering the subject of bread and brewers and dough conditioners. But before we begin, please can I ask you to ensure that there are no programs running on your device that have your camera or your microphone open, as this might compromise your connection to our platform. And now I'd like to introduce our presenters today. My name is Sarah Orton, and I'm a baker and I'm technical manager at the SAF UK and Ireland. And with us today, we have Dr. John Quill Dawson, who is speaking from her home in Scotland. Welcome, John. Cool. Morning. And we are also joined by our applications and baking expert Christophe Gauthier from the home of the Le Saf Group in Lille in northern France. Welcome to you, Christophe. Good morning. And finally, we have Gulten Yamur, who has recently returned to the UK from her home in Turkey. So she's currently enjoying a period of quarantine in Worcester. Welcome to you, Gulten. And good morning. Gilton will be presenting later on, but she has been largely responsible for the organisation of this webinar. We hope you will all find it interesting and informative. Uh, at the end, we shall be answering your questions, so please post them in the chat bar at the side of your screens. But please post to moderators only, unless you don't mind everybody knowing who is asking the question. Uh, any that we don't have time for, or that might need a fuller answer than we have time for today, we will answer directly by email to you. So to begin with, I'd just like to take a moment to explain where these types of ingredients fit into the ethos of the wider LASAF group. The LASAF group has been developing and refining their expertise in fermentation technology for more than 165 years. And during that time, the company has expanded from its origins in northern France into a well-respected global enterprise offering knowledge and experience to customers and companies both great and small. Bread can be found at the heart of cultures in every corner of the world, and the SAF is committed to serving its clients in more than 185 different countries. Continuous investment in research and development, coupled with innovations in production techniques, has enabled the SAF to widely diversify its offering, so that now we supply specialized yeasts and other products, not only for baking and brewing, but for a variety of other industries around the world. The ready supply of yeast with reliable and consistent performance has helped to drive a rapid expansion of global bakery product and process development. And the staff's own scientists, technicians and master bakers have been right there in the vanguard of these innovations. Over the years, the SAF bakery technicians have worked extensively alongside bakers, enabling them to develop and manufacture their products more efficiently, more consistently, and with better quality. Our holistic customer service encompasses not only yeast and raw materials, but advice on product quality, equipment, and processes too. And the SAF group continues to further expand its expertise developing efficient and focused ingredient solutions to help bakers to solve the most fundamental production conundrum. How can I make my products more cost-effective and consistent, but without compromising on product quality and customer satisfaction? Our long experience of bakery products and processes can help you to solve that problem. The addition of LFI to the LASAF group means that whereas previously we supplied yeast, sourdough, and a range of improvers to the UK market, we have now increased our capacity to formulate bespoke ingredients that can be designed for specific products and processes. And you'll be hearing more about that later on. But over the next hour or so, we shall be discovering these ingredients and how they can contribute to the quality and consistency of your products. We shall be discussing applications, labeling and technical functionality, concluding with a question and answer session. So please don't be shy about posting your questions in the chat box at the side of your screens. But for now, I shall hand over to Dr. John Quill Dawson, who will be taking us through the functionality of bread improver raw materials. Thank you, John Quill. Good morning, everybody. Thanks, Sarah. 
purpose of today is to give you an insight into why we use bread improvers and to highlight their functions and benefits for the baking industry. In this short overview, I'll touch on some of the key components we use and explain the importance of them whilst making bread. As a UK and Ireland formulator for LASAF, it's my role to identify the key requirements you may use and may need in your processes and create an appropriate functional system. So first of all, what do we mean by a bread improver? We can categorize it into two basic functions. Firstly, a dough conditioner, which we use to aid the processing of the dough itself and affect the finished bread quality. And secondly, a flour improver, <coughs> which we can use to uh, improve the quality of the flour. In many cases, we actually use combinations of both these systems to create the finished bread improvers. So, why do we use bread improvers? Simply, we use them to a selection of different components to interact in, with the components of the flour and other dough co components to enhance the quality of the dough, improve its machinability through the process, and to create the desired finished bread quality. Typical components would include fats, flours, emulsifiers, ascorbic acid, reducing agents and enzymes. Each component has a specific function and interacts with a specific fraction of the flour in order to achieve this function. An example would be ascorbic acid. This is used to interact with the gluten network present in the flour to improve the machinability and extensibility of the dough by strengthening the gluten present in the flour. This means that flours with an average protein quality or content can be used rather than the use of high quality flours or additional gluten to the recipe. This gives bakers much more flexibility and choice over the ingredients. So what benefits can we expect from our bread improvers? Well, that simply comes down to what we want to use the bread improver for. Primarily, we design bread improvers to do a number of different functions. Firstly, to improve dough or bread structure, to affect the finished product bread quality texture, to improve its machinability, and by that I mean the dough extensibility and elasticity, to target specific eating qualities, or to improve shelf life, and this is either through softness or through mold-free systems. The choice of the function will depend on what the customer and the process require, and some of the systems can be designed for more general purpose products or specific for different characteristics. For example, we might want to consider something for a specific crust or for a high volume bread. So the simple definition of a bread improver is a blend of ingredients, additives and processing aids. This can be used to affect the quality of the product, the dough tolerance, the shelf life and the raw material selection. It's important to remember what they can't do. Simply, they can't change a poor grade flour into a high grade flour. They can only be made to make the chosen flour perform to its maximum capability. An important point to remember. If we take each category of components individually, firstly we want to consider the ingredients. Examples of ingredients used in bread improvers would be fats, flours, sugar, salt, these types of materials. If we are mix making mixes or premixes, obviously the percentage of ingredients present would be much greater. And then we would look to add other components, such as flavors, sourdoughs, textures such as seeds, toasted flours for color, etc. But we're only considering bread improvers today, so we're only looking at the functional ingredients present in the system. And these are generally the ingredients which we expect to declare, but don't have an E number. So the functional ingredients um, are in a bread improver are nominally clean and these would be the f ingredients everyone is familiar with but 
do, you, do we all remember why we use them? So one of the fundamental ingredients used in a bread improver would be the fat. There are two types of fat we can use. Firstly, a high melting point fat, which we use to modify structure and texture. And secondly, soft fats, which we use to confer eating quality or improve shelf life. We can also use oils at La Safra UK, and this can be used directly into the blend for two purposes. One is to increase the softness of the product, or we can use them at very low levels, and this is used as an anti-dusting agent. And this helps as an, to dampen the actual powder themselves, and this is key for reducing bakery dust and it helping with the potential risks around baker's asthma. Another important category um, used of the ingredients are the functional flours. Typically, we would use soya flour or malt flour or sometimes chickpea flour. So the flours are used in the dough conditioners and they are all enzyme active. Um, to provide additional benefits over the enzymes we already incorporate into the functional system. For example, soya flour contains lipoxygenase. This is an important agent when you're looking to bleach the crumb, i.e. give you a much whiter crumb. Um, whereas malt flour, you might want to use for its oven spring capabilities or its dough rheology impact. As I mentioned, chickpea flour can also be used in our dough conditioners. Um, and the reason we use that is it also has a similar function to soya flour, but it has the added benefit that we can class it as a cleaner product because it doesn't have an allergen declaration. The next group of components are the additives. These are the food grade chemicals, all of which have an E number associated with them. These would include emulsifiers, stabilizers, preservatives, acidifiers, as well as our oxidizing and reducing agents. The functionality of this group of materials is very specific, and the exact doses are used to produce a particular function. Additionally, some of these additives have legal requirements, and it's important to understand what is permitted, how much, as well as what product they are suitable for. One of the key groups of um, additives we use in, dough, in bread improvers are the emulsifiers. These combine with either the gluten or the starch components of the flour to provide their key attribute. They are carefully selected depending on which functionality is required. For example, if we're looking to increase volume or create a high volume bread, we would look to use a datum ester. This produces a fine, strong, crumb structure due to the interaction of the datum ester with the gluten or protein network in the flour. Whereas if you were looking to make a premium bread, you would also look for a soft crumb as well as a strong crumb. And this might mean using SSL or combinations of datum, SSL and monoglyceride because this allows the interaction not only with the gluten network but also within the starch networks. So the choice of emulsifier depends particularly on the type of bread and the function required, as well as the process we're undertaking. For example, if you're considering a retarding process, then nearly always we need to consider the use of an emulsifier in this to give the additional stability. The second key group of additives are the oxidizing and reducing agents, which are used in many of the dough conditioners. These aid the dough development during the mixing and proofing times and work in an antagonizing function to, on the disulfide bonds. This is known as chemical dough development and allows the repair of the gluten network as a result of the damage caused by the mechanical action of the mixing process and it also provides additional strength to the dough and supports the gas retention during the proof. Depending on the system being used and the type of flour depends on the type of 
chemical development we require. For example, if we're using a high-speed system using high-protein flowers in a Chorley wood batch process, we would need significantly more chemical development than we would if we were considering a bulk fermentation system. And this would be reflected in the type of bread improver we recommend and our technical teams would recommend. A simple point to remember for oxidizing and reducing agents is that the oxidizing agents will tighten the dough up whereas the reducing agent be used to relax it. The final group of components used in bread improvers are the processing aids. These are very specific materials which are key to the process but have no function in the finished product. Examples of processing aids include enzymes, yeast foods and the carriers. Under current legislation, this category of materials doesn't need to declare, be declared on the finished product. And this is an important characteristic to remember when we look and consider the processing aids. One of the key functions about enzymes is that they are specific proteins which interact with other materials to perform a single task. Their presence allows the reaction or the task to occur much faster. That means they're acting as a catalyst for that reaction. And the one important thing to remember is that all enzymes are unique. Currently, we have over 300 enzymes that are classified as food grade enzymes. And they dif differ in how they perform, where they come from, and what we use them for. The main reason that enzymes are classed as processing aids is that they perform most effectively at temperatures between 30 and 70 degrees. Above this, end, this temperature, the enzyme itself becomes denatured. And what I mean by this is the protein is effectively unraveled. So the enzyme is no longer functional and can be considered as no longer present. As a result of this property, the, um, the, pre the enzyme's presence in the final product is not, is not there and therefore we can class it as a processing aid. In the baking industry, we use a number of different enzyme activities and these arise from a number of different source origins. The main origins we would use are fungal or bacterial. Bacterial enzymes are used um, when we need more aggressive performance, but they are used very cautiously um, because of that, and only when the fungal enzymes themselves do not give us the desired performance. Typical categories of enzymes would be amylases, hemicellulases, proteases, lipases, or oxidases. The choice of enzyme or enzyme combination would be dependent on the function and the process being undertaken for an individual system or bread. For example, we might choose a, an amylase because we want to reduce the fermentation time or increase our baking volume. On the other hand, we might use a protease because we want to soften strong gluten. We're using a particularly tough flour for example, um, an American-based flour, or we want to improve pan flow um, or dough rheology. The choice of components we use and consequently the design of an improver system depends on a range of factors. These include what raw materials are being used, the process itself, and any restrictions. Do we want a clean system? Do we want a non-GM system? Do we need it to be allergen free? And this information is critical when we identify and achieve the right bread improver for the right process. For example, if you're considering a clean system, there is no point of recommending an improver that contains emulsifier. The other criteria to consider when we're designing an improver will depend on the finished product itself. And this will come from the customer. The team at the SAP will review the processes being used by the customer and identify what functionalities 
are used in that individual case. From this, we can either tailor make a choice of um, improver, which can be a completely new combination, or we can come up with an, a system of existing products and tailor make them into a recipe that is bespoke for your process. Shortly, Christoph and Sarah will talk you through some of the more specific products we have at um, the SAF and go through the range and portfolio that are available to you. Thank you, John Quill. There's a lot of information there. Thank you very much for that. Don't forget to post your questions in the chat bar if you'd like some further explanation a bit later on or if you'd like us to give you a fuller answer by email. Um, don't be shy about that. Uh, before we go on, um, I'd like to invite you to take part in a little survey. And this one is asking, what are the most common challenges you face during your bread production? You can click on any or all of these to vote. And I'll give you a moment to do that. It'd just be interesting to see what the, uh, the biggest problems are in the industry at the moment. Very interesting. Oh, gosh, <laughs> that's very interesting. Pretty much equally all of those things. Let's sticky those on the most prevalent things by the look of it. Thank you very much for taking part. That's exceedingly interesting. So sticky those are the biggest problem. John Quill, I think we've got some work cut out for us there. Um, so over and under proofing. Very, very interesting. So we've got some, um, it looks like there are some flower issues at the moment. And uh, so we'll be happy to advise you in any way that we can on that. Thank you very much for taking part on that. Uh, and now I'm going to hand over to Christoph, who will present to us an example of a specialised improver that's been designed for a specific application. Over to you, Christoph. Thank you. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. So today uh, we'll make a focus on a, a minute bread uh, bread improver. Uh, so why a minute bread bread improver? We Le Safre developed uh, this bread improver several uh, years ago uh, in order to 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 to, to uh, find a solution how to reduce the flaking effect, the dryness, and the shrinkage on the par bake. Uh, we notice that uh, our customer face a lot of problem on this uh, on this problem, so that's why we develop this uh, minute bread uh, bread improver, which is a bread improver and also a concept, a solution, a complete solution. The objective is was to 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 reduce uh, all this problem in order to have a very short baking time. So in fact, it is a bread improver. It is uh, combined to a uh, baking uh, solution. Uh, as I told you, it is a concept. So I will go for the next one. The main uh, specification, so minute bread, it is a par bake frozen bread with an, uh, an extremely short bake off time. Uh, usually it is between two to four minutes. Minute bread, it is a LESAF patent. Uh, in terms of uh, appearance, the volume is similar to the par bake bread. Yeah. The final color is uh, almost uh, finished. Uh, it's not white, it's completely almost finished. After bake off, uh, with this solution, there is no uh, crust flaking effect uh, due to the specific bread improver formula. Also, uh, we can extend the shelf life our, on our baguette, on our crusty bread, because this bread improver is mainly dedicated to the crusty bread, any type of crusty bread. And the fact uh, to use this solution, we limit the shrinkage. This is the main specification. Uh, we took an example of a recipe. Uh, I will show you later. Uh, you can apply this. Uh, you can use this bread improver for any type of uh, recipe or any type of bread. Uh, for example, we use uh, the recipe of baguette, the common baguette. The recipe is quite a standard. 
Uh, in the UCP, you have a standard bread flour. No need to use a special flour for this uh, technique. The hydration is uh, 60%. It can be also uh, adapted to the, to the local uh, flour quality. You use the salt, 2%. It can be a little bit less according your, 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 your specification. We use a normal standard yeast. In that case, in the recipe, it is a fresh yeast. You can add uh, some sourdough, any type of sourdough. It can be a, a dry sourdough. It can be a liquid sourdough. It can be a live sourdough. It can be deactivated uh, sourdough. And it is very, uh, in our case, you have to add the uh, minute bread improver. The level of use of this improver, the optimal, optimal dosage is 2.5% uh, on the flow weight. So you see uh, the, form the formula is quite a standard. There is nothing special. The, speci the, 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 the specification will be more on the uh, baking uh, profile. So for the process, the process is quite normal. Uh, mixing, mixing, there is no any uh, specification for mixing. It can be with uh, any type of mixing. The bulk fermentation, in the case of the baguette, we put 10 minutes, but uh, it could be also longer. Uh, if, you, if you make a three hours fermentation, even more, you can add it also. It is not a problem. You have a dividing. You have to rest the dough as a usual process. In our case, it was baguette. The proofing time was one hour, 30 minutes to two hours. The temperature is 28 degrees. Uh, for the crusty bread, usually we don't go more than 28, 30 degrees in order to um, avoid the, the excess of uh, uh, humidity in the proofer, uh, which is quite uh, specific. It is a baking. <laughs> the, the baking time in our case is a, was 13 minutes at 230 degrees with a steam on a rotary oven which is very specific is we need to get the cross coloration in a very short time without any collapsing. Uh, usually, in order to give you an idea of the baking profile, when you make uh, the par-bake uh, bread at 200 degrees, 210, you have to bake this type of bread 20 degrees more. Okay. Uh, for the cooling time, uh, usually for baguette at 350 grams, the cooling time should be 30 minutes. In order to freeze, to blast freeze the baguette when the core temperature uh, achieves 38 degrees. It is a very, very important uh, point to, to follow uh, in order to avoid any problem uh, during bake-off and during the shelf life of the product. So the blast freezing uh, will be uh, in uh, minus 30 degrees. In order to reach minus 8, minus 10 degrees uh, in, uh, inside the, the, the baguette. The packaging will be also very important. And you have to put in a packaging in order to protect the, the, the final product from the dryness and from the freezer burn which is, we, we face uh, may, uh, very often this problem just because the packaging is not well, um, is not very, you know, very good, um, is not very good. Um, there is three uh, main points that uh, you have to follow because the bread solution, the bread improver solution and um, will work only if you follow this, uh, some very important point. Step baking, cooling, and brass freezing are fundamental to ensure the quality of the finished product in order to avoid dryness and flaky effect on the crust after bake-off. The bread improver will work only if you take care of this point. Uh, keep the, in order to keep the moisture inside the crumb and also in order to keep the organolectic property of the bread. So these three points are very, very important. 
Uh, so uh, don't hesitate to, 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 to take care of this. Uh, it's, sometimes we have some, uh, some case uh, where the, 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 the user uh, think, uh, okay, we use a per minute bread. It is a solution, but they, they forget also in the same time to not uh, take care of this point. And at the end, the result uh, did, uh, is not, they're not very satisfied because uh, they didn't uh, follow this advice. So very important to follow this. Uh, so it was uh, for the process until packaging. Now we'll talk about the, the bake-off. Uh, so the advantage of the minute bread are baking from freezer to oven. And you, you take from the freezer, you put in the oven without steam. Uh, it's not necessary to put steam. If you put you have steam in your oven, of course you can put few seconds of uh, of steam. Uh, the baking uh, time is very short. If you have a small roll uh, uh, at around 50 gram uh, weight, it will be only two minutes. If you have a big uh, bloomer, for example, at 700 gram, you will the bake off will be more around four minutes. Okay, so you take from the storage at minus. Uh, from minus 18, and you put directly in the oven uh, at uh, 200, 250 degrees. It can be a deck oven, it can be a convection oven, it can be also a, a rotary oven. Uh, it's not necessary to to toast to toast the product before baking. Uh, you can put directly from the from the oven from the freezer to the oven. We'll go now for the different uh, bread application. Uh, this bread improver is uh, well uh, dedicated for the all crusty bread that you may have in your production, uh, any type of baguette. Yeah. Uh, it can be chapata, it can be a sourdough bread, it can be a country bread, it can be a rye bread. There is different type of application. It's not very well um, dedicated for the um, for the sweet dough, uh, uh, but in some cases uh, you could uh, use it for for some uh, uh, bread with little bit sugar. Uh, if you know a little bit uh, the recipe of a pain au lait, uh, Viennese baguette, it can be applied for this uh, for this bread. Uh, it's not uh, completely adapted for the sweet dough, very sweet dough baguette, for a very sweet dough uh, product like a brioche, for example, with more than 10% sugar. So uh, in terms of a bread application, uh, the dough weight can go uh, from uh, 40 grams to uh, 800 grams per piece. Uh, this uh, bread improver is well dedicated for, for this. So this is for the, the main application crusty bread or sweet dough uh, application with less than 10% sugar. It can be, it can be. I will go for the next uh, slide. So in this uh, slide, uh, we will make uh, this a different uh, bread making uh, uh, application for frozen dough, frozen technique. So I will more focus on the, these two uh, application. This is a current uh, par bag. This is a par bag. And I would like to, to compare with the minute bread. With the minute bread. So until uh, Bake Off, we have the same um, product. Uh, we take uh, advantage uh, of the minute bread uh, product concept during the Bake Off. Uh, the Bake Off is the same. Uh, but on the final product, we have a better result uh, on the product, on the baguette. For example, final product shape, final product taste. And also, uh, as uh, for the par bake, the bake off is around 10 to 12, 12, 12 minutes for baguette. Our bake off is very short, two to four minutes. So we save time. So we have a, a product uh, in a shell in the short time compared to the par bake. In the same time, we have a better shape better appearance on the final product compared to the par bake. And also we have a better taste because we keep more organoleptic uh, property in the bread. 
due to the uh, this to due to this solution. So this is a comp compar comparison between the two techniques. Uh, for the next uh, slide, it is a photo uh, uh, in uh, in front of you at the left side. You can see uh, the crust uh, uh, appearance in the in the photo. The outside crust separate from the crumb, which is parbec, uh, the, 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 the parbec. Uh, uh, when you see at the right side in front of you, uh, on the right side, the mean, with the mean bread, bread, there is no crust separation at all. There is no also crumb shrinkage. You can see the, 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 the section looks better compared to the to the parbec. Here we have the photo with the parbec. You have a flaky effect. When with the minute bread improver, you keep the you keep the the crust uh, as is. So this is a comparison versus a parbec product. On uh, the final volume of the bread, uh, uh, in a blue color, it is before bake-off, and in a uh, orange color, it is after uh, bake-off. As you can see, uh, after, before bake-off, uh, we have a better volume with the minute bread. The, 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 the volume of the baguette, of the product, is even better. And after bake-off, uh, when we lose 10%, more than 10% volume before bake-off and after bake-off for per bake, we, use, we lose only 3% volume after bake-off, which is uh, quite a lot, uh, which is quite a lot. So it's significantly a, a big difference be between these uh, two techniques in terms of final volume and final appearance. Uh, we will go for the possible fault effect on the crust. This is what you, you face when you make a parbec and you have a lot of problem on the crust. Uh, when we compare the two products, uh, the product with the per minute uh, concept, per minute bread improver, the crust, uh, the product stay more crusty compared to the parbec in a green color. Uh, so this uh, analyze was uh, uh, evaluate was done by our sensory analysis of Le Safre. So this is a possible fault effect on the crust. Now we have also possible fault effect on the crumb. So as I told you, the, the product uh, will stay more soft and longer. So we, here you have the per minute bread improver compared to the parbec product. So we lose less water with our solution, which is give a better shelf life, uh, better freshness during uh, the, 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 when the product is bake off. So which is very, very important. It is important for baguette, but it's also very important for other type of bread. Uh, I think that's it for my uh, for my side. Uh, it is uh, if you have any uh, question on uh, this presentation on this uh, uh, per minute bread concept and improver, don't hesitate. Thank you very much, Christoph. That's very it was very interesting uh, uh, presentation about uh, this particular improver. It's interesting to see. But even with a specific improver that's designed for this specific process, the baker still needs to control quite carefully some aspects of his process in order to get the best result. So that really does um, show the point that uh, John Krull was making earlier, which is to say that uh, improvers are not magic powders. Um, it doesn't mean that the baker can take his eye off the ball. He's still got to be careful about what he's doing. Um, so that's, um, we have had a question here. I'm not sure if this uh, relates specifically to um, uh, per minute, uh, for minute bread, but I have a question here. Uh, can the bread improver be used for gluten-free bread? I think for, for general gluten-free uh, question, we will ask later on uh, in the question and answer session. But this particular one, Christoph, does it work for gluten-free products? 
I mean, clearly, uh, the, the the flour that we use in the, you know, if we were to put the functional ingredients on a gluten free carrier, would it work um, for gluten free products? Yes, if we use uh, the right uh, uh, ingredients, yeah. I think so. Yes, it could be applied. It could be applied. Yeah. Could be applied. Oh, that's yeah, yeah. Very good. Thank you yeah. very much. Yeah. Well, you can see that uh, we've got a new poll running. So thank you very much for voting. Uh, so we're interested to hear about the functionality of your your bread, uh, your dough, and your bread. What are what are the aspects of your products that you really want to improve most of all? And. Uh, so, as I said before, you can choose any or all of those options. I'm very interested to see what your, what your what the results are. And the answer is softness and mold-free shelf life. So that's clearly on the back of what we're all trying to do, which is to reduce food waste. So that's a, that's good to know that everyone's very, uh, very conscious about that. Crumb structure seems to be um a little bit of an issue for some of your crust characteristics that's interesting maybe it's because we don't uh we don't have such a big uh uh culture of crusty bread in this country we're still eating a lot of very soft bread so that's an interesting one and volume yeah that's very interesting to know thank you very much for joining in with that survey that's that's uh, fascinating so um the selection of the right improver for an application obviously will begin with a series of questions. So what are, what are the, what is the product I'm trying to create and what are its defining characteristics? Those are two key ones. What is the process I'm going to be using? But more importantly, as we've just seen from Christoph's uh, uh, presentation, what are the critical control, uh, control points that I need to control to make sure that I can get the product that I'm looking for? Um, Christoph, I know that and I'm quite sure that during your time with LASAF, you've helped bakers to answer those questions. Can you give us an example of uh, a troubleshooting? Uh, uh, yes, um, I have uh, an example. Um, you know, uh, several uh, years ago, uh, the bakers uh, in France uh, start uh, to, to develop the, um, the overnight uh, uh, dough uh, process. Uh, but when they put the dough in the chiller at low temperature, five degrees during overnight, uh, the day after when they bake when they bake the product, they notice that there is a lot of blister on the surface of the bread. Uh, so uh, it was not very attractive. It was new for the consumer to have a blister on the bread. It was not attractive at all. Uh, so the baker uh, came to to us and said. Uh, Le safre, uh, uh, could you uh, solve uh, this problem? Uh, could you uh, provide us a solution, bread improver solution, in order to, to remove all these blisters on the surface of the bread? And um, when we knew that, we, we asked them how they work. Because, uh, you know, each baker has his own habit of working. How they work? How they? What is the recipe? How long they keep the dough in the chiller? How they make? Uh, how they proof? How they bake? And we collect all this uh, information from the market, and um, we de we start to to do some tests uh, in uh, our baking center in Lille, and uh, we we check uh, different parameters: uh, the dough, the dough rheology, the how uh, the dough, how long the dough stays in the, in the proofer. And we did a lot of tests, <laughs> many tests, in fact, <laughs> in order to cover all the, the parameters. All the variables, yeah. Yes, and uh, we tried different solutions, different ingredients at that moment. And uh, finally, uh, step by step, uh, we, we notice an improvement uh, on the final product. And we achieve we achieve the the, the, the objective to in order to uh, elaborate a bread improver at the end, mm -hmm. and uh, at the end uh, we we develop this bread improver, 
uh, and we call this brain improver now uh, crustilis. Uh, I think in France, uh, all the bakers know crustilis. Uh, uh, we still, uh, <laughs> it's still a famous brain improver because uh, <laughs> the crustilis uh, simplifies uh, the life of the baker. Uh, you have many, many users. So it is an example of a, of a troubleshooting uh, and a solution provided by the SAF. Oh, that's great for the for the baker for the market thank you christoph thank Mala you Sarah. you're welcome so um as you've heard um what we will be uh, uh when we're trying to select our uh, improver or our dough conditioner there are lots of questions that we will need to consider um and the selection can be approached from different angles so first of all we can think about the categories of bread the families of bread types that we might be making. So are we looking for something that's crusty or soft or a particular kind of texture? Uh, or we can begin from the functionality that we're looking for in our dough. Are we going to be um, using a lot of machinery to process it? Are we going to be laminating it, for example? Uh, or we can consider the, the actual manufacturing process as the starting point for our bread is, so, you know, including lamination, retarding, uh, is it going to be a direct process or a long fermentation process and things like this. Of course, when we're considering our uh, improver, all of these things will have a, an impact on the quality of the bread that we're finally going to make. So to some extent, we will need to consider all of these points. Oh, we have time. The SAF UK and Ireland, of course, has quite an extensive portfolio of products already, and they are uh, divided into four different brands. So uh, taking these one by one. So the SAF Pro brand is the one that contains our, uh, most of our clean label products, but it also contains the products that have been developed over the years as specific technical solutions for particular problems and processes that we've encountered during that time. And one of the ones that you will probably be most familiar with is 0.5W, which was designed originally for the production of uh, part baked bread uh, in the early 1980s when it was first introduced into the UK bread market. So it's been around for a very long time and it's still uh, one of our uh, most popular products. The Ibis range, on the other hand, has improvers and conditions that are designed for more general purposes. They tend to have a broader range of applications and they tend to be formulated for bakers who are looking for a smaller inventory of products that can be used in various different uh, bakery applications. And then the Inventus range, this one is a relatively new one for us. Uh, this one encompasses premixes and blends of functional raw materials with other ingredients to create a basic dough which the um, baker can then adapt uh, as he chooses to create a range of finished products. For example, by changing the process, he might uh, include a period of bulk fermentation to create something a bit more open textured or to change the crust characteristic and all that sort of thing. But uh, they, they actually produce a, a basic dough that the baker can then customize. And then finally, we come to the custom solutions. And this is one of the services that we provide where we tailor make an ingredient where we design an ingredient in collaboration with a customer uh, for a specific purpose or to make a specific product for a specific process or for a, a possibly a specific flour that's being used or you need a combination of all of those things. Full details of our portfolio can be found on our website and uh, in our catalogue, which we can send you if you'd like one, just let us know. But to give you an idea, uh, here's a snapshot of some of our ingredients and how we categorize them. So here, we, as you can see, we've got all the different um, different uh, parameters that we might be considering when we're choosing a, 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 an improver. And here we've got the different uh, families of bread, as it were. So this is, is just a, a small part of the SAFPRO range, but it gives you an idea of, of how we might categorize them. So, for example, the 0.5W, which is for a part baked frozen process, so it's for freezing, it's a little bit of softening, it's good for extensibility and it's very good for tolerance and volume because that's what it was designed for. Uh, 300, for example, is one of our clean label products. So it does all of these functions. We have an organic one. This one is a pastry relaxer. So this is for, mach for machinability. 
uh, to allow for uh, lamination and things like that, but it also works very well for pastry that's going to be frozen. Uh, this is for a, this is a softening agent. So you get the idea. So all of these different uh, improvers have been designed for specific purposes. And then if we take a quick look at the IBIS range, excuse me, similarly, you will see that there are dots in many more of the columns because these are more general purpose uh, improvers and dough conditioners. Uh, the, the K denomination after a, a name means kosher. So you know, we can um, provide kosher versions of these products if necessary. And again, they're designed for specific uh, processes, but they do have more general application. Uh, here at the SAF course, we are keeping an eye on emerging trends and future needs of our bakers and uh, the consumers. Uh, things like health and nutrition, dietary trends and allergenicity and things like that. A desire for clean labels, which is a very strong trend at the moment, I'm sure you're aware. The, all of these issues keep us uh, constantly searching for innovative solutions. John Quill, perhaps you can give us an example of some emerging trends that are catching your eye at the moment? Yes, um, I think one of the biggest ones I'm seeing at the moment is vitamins. Believe it or not, people are very interested in vitamins, particularly vitamin D enhanced products. There's a lot of queries about that at the moment because obviously there's been links between the COVID-19 and um, benefits of um, taking vitamin D. So people are considering putting that in. I mean, other things that there are we can do to help is to help with recipes to minimize things like salt sugar fats so you know working on the obesity side of nutrition um, so these are all the sort of trends that we're seeing through and improvers can be combined either with um, a vitamin premix or we can do um, through our um, LFI factory we can actually do vitamin blends that can be add-ons um, which are bespoke to a customer's recipe and there's a number of you know products at the moment being developed for specific customers um, mm -hmm. in this area so you know this is um, quite a quite a big area at the moment I would say is getting quite a lot of attention. Mm. The obesity thing is uh, obviously going to going to emerge very large I think on our horizons very soon with uh, the um, Public Health England uh, trend for reducing calories and all of this sort of thing. So uh, the, I should think there'll be quite a lot of things coming up on that uh, Indeed. in the future. Yes, thank you, yeah. John Quill. Uh, and now I'd just like to uh, let uh, uh, Gilton tell you a little bit about our production plant at LFI. Thank you, Gilton. Um, thank you, Sarah. Uh, today I would like to introduce uh, briefly LFI, that is our own blending plant. Uh, LFI uh, is an established company that has been producing dry food powder for food industry since 1987 uh, and it was acquired by Lossaf uh, Group in 2016. It is based in uh, Worcestershire and serves the baking industry in the whole of the UK and Ireland. Uh, LFI is a tall blender uh, for a diverse range of customers, especially in the milling and the baking sector. Uh, we offer bespoke powder blends uh, of tailor-made formulations based on a specific customer requirement, uh, as well as our own uh, blends. Uh, the blend, uh, plant capabilities, uh, coupled with lots of technical expertise, uh, allow us to offer a high level of flexibility and uh, reactivity uh, in terms of providing uh, better solutions to our customers. We can give advice uh, to our customer based on their formulations, uh, as we have expertise in uh, baking, uh, vitamin and enzyme technologies. Uh, also, we have uh, a wealth of experience in uh, tailoring raising agents for specific uh, application. And LFI is pleased to be able uh, to provide uh, very efficient and cost-effective uh, blends to our customers. Uh, either directly from our catalog uh, or as a piece for product. Uh, regarding uh, product range, um, our comprehensive product range includes uh, bread mixes, improver, uh, pizza concentrates, uh, gluten-free mixes. 
Um, in the plant, there is a dedicated area for free uh, mixing, uh, uh, for free from mixing that allow us to produce uh, gluten-free products. Uh, regular process and product validations, uh, allergen controls, and the risk assessments uh, of the ingredients are made in order to comply with BRC accreditation, kosher certification, and uh, loss of uh, manufacturing uh, quality and environmental policies. We continue to invest uh, in the site to secure and improve all these points. Uh, I would like to finish my presentation by repeating our message that uh, we are here uh, to be your business partner, uh, to support you in your uh, projects, and we continue our work uh, to offer you better products and solutions. So you can contact us uh, using the contact details in the final, sli the final slide you will see uh, in a moment. Uh, first, we have a last survey, uh, then we will start to receive your question. Thank you very much. Sarah? Thank you, Gulton. So our final, our final, excuse me, our final survey then, uh, just before the questions and answers, is uh, what are the criteria that most affect your purchasing decisions? So if you'd like to have a little vote there, and once again, you can vote for any or all of those options. And the answer is quality. Well, I sincerely hope that you can guarantee we can uh, uh, we can reassure you that uh, we do our utmost to keep the quality of our products as high as possible and the quality of our advice. So I'm I'm hoping that we even that we we are going to uh, be able to uh, continue in that trend as we go on. Cost and use, of course, is a very important feature for everybody. We're all uh, looking at the pennies and uh, trying to get the most that we can. Technical support, of course, we are very happy to provide what technical support we can. Sustainability uh, is still quite a significant chunk in there, so that's good to see. Sustainability is something that we are very keen to uh, provide if we can. So thank you very much for your attention. We've come to the end of our presentation and uh, we have hope you found it very interesting and useful. And now we're going to take a few questions not too late to ask, uh, please post them in the chat bar at the side of your screen. And if we don't have time um, to catch them all today, we will um, email you uh, separately. We do have a few questions. Um, the first one here, I think, is for you, Gulton. Uh, no, it's not for you, Gulton. It's for you, John Quill. Um, clean label improver. If there's no emulsifier in a clean label improver, how does this affect the functionality compared with other improvers? Um, that probably comes down to what process we're using. It can affect the, the functionality, um, but we can um, compensate for the lack of emulsifier, um, provided that the process is well controlled. Um, albeit there, there, you know, there is tolerance within these systems, um, but probably not as much as if you have a, a uh, emulsifier present. However, you know, it is something we're working on. We're constantly looking at new enzymes um, and fats that can do these functionalities, and that's what we're we're sort of developing at the moment. So it's not um, an insurmountable problem, but it's it is something that we have to work very closely, um, really, with the raw materials in the and the particular process um, to get the best results. I would say. Yeah, okay. So emulsifiers kind of provide a bit of belt and braces, don't they, uh, in terms of tolerance for, for, for dose and for bread? They can do, yes. They're, yeah. they're certainly, um, they're, they've been relied on for a very long time. Mm. So, you know, we are looking at um, um, a lot of, uh, uh, replacing quite a lot of functionalities um, when we go clean. The same when we remove things like soil flour. It's been a catch-all in part of the improver system for a very long time. So, um, yes, so they are, are they are they are key, but we can replace them. Can replace them. That's excellent to know. Thank you. Um, we have a question here, possibly for you, Christoph. Um, what temperature should your frozen bread be before you pack it? Does it need to be at minus 18 before you pack it? <laughs> uh, 
uh, for the blast freezing uh, stage, uh, usually it's at minus uh, 25, maximum minus 30 degrees. Mm -hmm. uh, the most important is uh, to reach uh, minus 8 degrees in core temperature. Core temperature, right? minus okay. 8. Right. Uh, for example, uh, normally for baguette product, maximum uh, blast freezing uh, time in order to reach minus 8 is 30 minutes. 30 minutes, yeah. 30 minutes. But it, it could which... depend on the, the geometry of the product, I suppose. So of course, of a course. Product, it could take longer. But the key thing is to get the core temperature right. Yes, it? this, that's why we say minus 8 should be uh, enough you know, the, before packing. Okay, before packing. that's great. Thank you very much. Of course, the packing, uh, the packing stage should be uh, quite fast also. In yes, order of to, course. Uh, so it doesn't, um, doesn't warm up and thaw out. Yes. yes yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, a question here. Do you supply a dough improver that will keep a microwavable bread crusty? Yes, I think we do. I like to think we do. <laughs> We've had a microwavable improver in our portfolio for quite some time. So, yes, please um, let us uh, get in touch with us uh, later and uh, we will advise you about that. Yes. Um, another question here, how much shift is there towards clean label improved improvers? Is it large producers or smaller in, uh, producers? I think that's a very interesting question. I think in my own experience, it tends to be the larger producers because they tend to be supplying to retailers who are the ones that uh, are, are keenest, I think, for clean label packaging. Um, Gulton, do you have any uh, experience about that? Clean label improvers, does it tend to be larger producers or smaller producers that are most interested in clean label? Mm, actually, I don't have um, uh, experience, but uh, I think clean label is now very trendy uh, in the world, especially in the UK. Uh, that's why I think it depends on the regions. Uh, okay. For UK, it's getting really uh, bigger. Yeah, this is what I see. Yeah, uh, John Quill, about um, are we seeing more requests for clean label formulation? Do you think? Yes, I would say more people are looking to remove, if not completely clean label, certainly um, types of um, fats. Um, obviously, palm is one that people uh, constantly want to remove. So that does rule out some of the emulsifiers. Um, so, yes, the trends are going in that general direction, but mm -hmm. as we've sort of mentioned, it is it is a bigger challenge when we have to face a clean label alternative um, mm -hmm. for some, some of the pr processes, um, and that's what we have to keep an eye on. But I would say it really pushes from the retail market and yeah. for who the end customer is. I think regulation also is important, depends on the country. Is, uh, is quite key in this, yeah. yes, yes. Christophe, how, how, how is it um, in France? Are they tending towards clean label in France? Yeah, same. Yeah, same. 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 Yeah. Okay. same. So it yeah. does seem to be the, uh, a, a, quite a key trend at the moment. Mm -hmm. That is, um, for the moment, uh, they talk on it at the moment, and uh, but uh, I think in the future it will be... Uh, yeah. it will be uh, mm -hmm. I just want so to go back. To. Sorry, yes. I just want to go back to a question we had earlier about uh, gluten-free uh, improvers for gluten-free bread. Uh, John, do you have any comment that you might be able to make about that? Um, specific about gluten-free improvers. I mean, obviously, apart from the gluten-free carrier, but is there any specific functionality that you look, need to look for? Well, for yes. Obviously, obviously, the flour base for most gluten-free products is very different. So um, the selection of in enzymes um, we would use would be quite different. You tend to be looking for things that would give you some volume, a lot of softness, um, and from that point of view, you're still reliant on gums to a degree rather than more enzymes. There are enzymes that will work with the, the starches, but you have to be very careful choosing those because obviously starches are very easily broken down to give you softer, too soft products and where slicing is um, in, involved. Uh, the other one is crust characteristic, um, trying to get more color without adding more sugar. And that's something that we can we, we can do. But the, the challenge is actually getting the gluten-free enzymes. Not all enzymes are available in a gluten-free format. 
um, because in you can get them but they tend to be liquid which is a bit of a challenge when you're making powders so we have we have some limitations around that but the the, the portfolio is getting bigger um, and certainly it's something that we would work on a specific product with hmm. okay well talking about um, liquids um, we have also had a question that says are all improvers in powder forms or do other forms exist for example liquid or paste um, Christoph I know that uh, Lasaf have been doing some work on uh, introducing functionality into sourdough for example by adding um, carbon softening enzymes I think perhaps you could tell us a little bit about that yes uh, so now we we are working on a on a range of sourdough more than more uh, sourdough will be uh, implemented in our range and also in the sourdough we we would like to we are working on a, uh, adding a functionality in the sourdough uh, for example uh, a sourdough with uh, sourness uh, not sourness uh, softness uh, <laughs> functionality mm -hmm. sourdough with anti-moldings uh, functionality so this is we are working on it at the moment because um, uh, the customer okay they know the functionality of sourdough uh, the sourdough bring uh, acidity bring uh, flavor bring a uh, taste uh, bring but also they they would like also uh, a functionality special functionality so we are working on it at the moment uh, we start to we start to have uh, one uh, one or two products at the moment we are at the beginning of this uh, work but uh, it is a big request also from the market from the customer good very interesting um i have a supplementary question about gluten free where uh, someone is mentioning that the one big problem that they have is separate is crumb separation from the crust on their gluten free products uh, John Clun, any comment about that? I know you've had experience in gluten-free production. Um, yes, <laughs> I, I would say for that it's partly down to recipe and it's partly down to process. And um, there are some troubleshooting things that we can suggest um, based on mixing times and um, actual proving stages for doughs. And it, one of the key things for gluten-free is actually maintaining and achieving dough temperatures correctly at the right um, without using them too warm, but to, they have to be um, in the right ballpark. So um, yes, we can, that's something we can talk about. It's quite a long-winded question. So rather than doing, think, yes, <laughs> doing a whole answer to it well, today, yeah. I would say, <laughs> um, yes, we can help. And we have done, I've done yeah. some work recently with a customer uh, based around that. So um, yes. Right. So um, if, if the person, I won't mention who it is, but if the person is answer, asking that question, we'd like to get in touch later. Yeah. We can talk through that. We can talk that through, yes. Yeah, OK. That's fine, thank you. Um, a couple of other questions that we've had come in. First of all, is uh, is there any loss of performance with improvers that have reached or passed their sell-by date? This is quite a quite an interesting one. Um, because, uh, <laughs> bread improvers tend to have a fairly long shelf life anyway, um, but uh, does the performance kind of go off a cliff at the end of the shelf life or is it? decrease gradually how does that work um i would say it it decreases gradually um it depends a little bit on what the enzyme base is because <coughs> some enzymes um last better than others um you can get an extra two couple of months out of a, a bread improver quite happily um but it really depends um a little bit on the storage if they've been stored in cool ambient conditions as opposed to warm ambient conditions, you might you you probably would get away with it. If it's been a particularly hot summer, uh, which down south you might might achieve, whereas up here you don't. Um, I would suggest that it's uh, it it can be a little bit more uh, challenging. And yes. um, so it comes down to storage and um, yeah, what which in enzymes are involved. Right. Okay. That's uh, that's good to know. Thank you. Um, now, this is an interesting one. How important is it to follow the improved dosage that the supplier recommends? So, what's the effect of overdosing or underdosing your improver? I think is the is the the basis of this question. Do you want me to take that one? <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, go on, Christoph, to take that one. <laughs> I'll let Christoph start with that one. <laughs> yeah. Christoph, what would you say for answer to that question? Is <laughs> that is, uh, what's when you, what, what's likely to be the effect of overdosing or underdosing an improver? Yes, um, when, uh, for example, uh, for today, I said the our minute blood improver is at 2.5% mm -hmm. on fly weight. That means we um, we are we have all the efficiency of the blood improver at this level. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, if you overdose age, if you overdose, you can you can have the um, reverse effect ah. uh, because you will add more enzyme, you will add more um, as a component. So you can have a reverse. That means uh, the, 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 the dough can be sticky. Uh, you will get uh, too much color during bake off. Uh, it will prove too much. And also the reverse, if you those the level of use is too low, you will not get the efficiency of the brain improver. Uh, so when so we that's say- that's essentially it, isn't it really? That the, uh, the improvers are all formulated and you yeah. can answer this John Quill they're all formulated so that the functional ingredients are acting at yes. their optimal level for the, yes. for the process yes. or the bread that's yeah. being used yeah of course you can play a little bit with the dosage you can if you reduce it a little bit uh, the dosage by 10 percent uh, five percent of it's, it's acceptable mm -hmm. it's just when you try to, to decrease too much you can face some problem yeah uh, yeah. In, the course, side, in the two sides. Yes, if, if, for example, you can you can add a little more or reduce it a little bit if you've got a, a variation in the quality of your flour, for example. Yes. Or if the, yes. If the ambient conditions are, are quite. Exactly. Good. Exactly. Sarah, I see a question, I think, related to Mute Bread. Uh, just uh, to ask do you have a product that you can add to the dough, add to, dough to stop flaking after frozen product defrost? I think uh, audience doesn't talk yeah. about the baking during the storage time. We observe, you know, some flaking uh, in the frozen products. Do you think minute bread also uh, yes, improved yeah. this? Uh, I think minute problem? bread is, is the way to go on that. Yes, I, I have answered that uh, that particular person now that I'll speak to them after the webinar and I'll, mm -hmm. I'll talk them through it. So, yeah. Okay. Um, Oh, yes, this is an interesting one. Are there any benefits in using a separate flour uh, bread improver and dough conditioner? So if you have the components of your improver and your conditioner separate, is there any benefit to that? Uh, for me, that would be, I think, if you're going to change your flour on a regular basis, you may wish to uh, consider doing that and keep the, the dough conditioner for the actual processing part. I think it's a challenge um, when you start having a separate add-on. You can do, do it, um, but if you're regularly changing ingredients and have less control over your ingredients, then it might be something to consider. But normally, I would say no. <laughs> you, I, I would say it wasn't really something I would recommend uh, unless you don't have um, the ability to control um, raw materials and ingredients. Right, that's good. Thank you. Um, I think just one more question. I think we're 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 almost out of time, really. Um, the uh, question I have here is: How can I be sure that the enzymes are safe to use in my product? Jonka, would you like to answer that one? Um, I can what, start with that what, one. What hoops do our enzymes go through? So our enzymes go through a use. huge number of hoops, uh, not by us ourselves. Um, before they are approved, they have to be um, obviously very well tested, almost to the same levels as any drug or medicine would be. So it does go through um, a huge number of hoops, but there is also um, a safety committee based out of Europe or ESSA, who constantly are testing uh, these enzymes and they're going through it currently at the moment, the whole portfolio to see which food enzymes, and this is why we know there's about 300 on the market, um, because they are going through each one and testing them and coming back with information. And it's a long process, but they do go through them currently. And if they find any um, issues um, on routes, 
then they are flagged up. But so far, I would say nothing has been flagged up as having any uh, concerns whatsoever. And I think they're uh, about a third of the way through the process. Yes, I believe so. Yes, it's a yep. very, very long. <laughs> it's a long yes. process. I think it's about a four or five year one, project. Yes. Yeah. I mean, while they're looking at the ones that are already being uh, being used, there, there, there are new um, enzymes that are coming onto the market that are being added to the list. So it's, it's, it's going to be a rolling program, I think, for, for some significant time. Um, this is a quick one um, that I know that a lot of people are, are interested in. Uh, what is the difference, if there is a difference, between datum and data esters, or is it the same thing? It's pretty. It is the same thing. The same they are thing. just 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 different names. Uh, one is perhaps a, a more familiar name for, um, but it is something that changes. Uh, a lot of chemical names change over the years. They come up with a new nomenclature, uh, and uh, that is one of one of them. Um, and uh, most people would 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 yeah. say yes. There is no difference, um, but it but it is. It it's is all, confusing. It's all E four seven two E. Yes. The same E number. It yeah. is the same E number, and that's the main thing. And it is the same functionality. That's great. Thank you very much indeed. Um, just before we close our session, then I would just like to say thank you very much to our presenters. Thank you very much, Christophe, for joining us from France. You're welcome. Thank you to John Quill for joining us from Scotland. Thank you. And thank you to Galton for joining us from Worcester. And um, in case uh, you'd like to see this webinar again, or if you'd like to uh, recommend it to somebody else to watch, you'll be able to catch it on the LASAF UK YouTube channel. If you just type in LASAF UK into the search of YouTube, you will catch it. Um, so please feel free to do so. Um, I'll just go back to the final, final um, screen if you'd like further information. Um, and please keep an eye on your inboxes for an invitation to our next webinar, which will be all about the functionality and uses for deactivated yeast. So um, that will be coming to a screen near you very soon. So we look forward to seeing you for that one. Thank you very much for your attention today, for your very interesting questions. And goodbye from us all. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs>